am very excited <laughs> and I cannot hide it <laughs> because we're finally starting the last book where you will feel that you can, which is the most important. Scales, arpeggios, octaves, chords, a new real piece, not just uh, kindergarten sweet melodies. And I'm very looking forward to it because it's actually a very rewarding stage where every single day you're gonna practice, you will see jumps in improvement, which is otherwise, you know, we feel very frustrated when we don't feel improvement the next day. Okay. Um, so today we are going to make sure that we establish the right movement in scales, arpeggios, concepts, octaves and chords. Yes, yeah, just the hand motion really, the wrist and elbow motion. And so then um, I will leave you on your own till you know, for a few days to go through the analysis stage. Just the first really part because this is what we will need for um, applying it in our warm-up and muscle strengthening exercises. They are super efficient. Extremely, extremely efficient. I have not found anything more efficient than that in 30 years of my life, in my pianist life. So they're super cool, but if you are not making everything correctly, you can injure your hands. So it's very important that you really do everything just like it's written in the book. Follow every instruction, don't miss out anything, especially arm weight and the rhythm of the motion. So you, no tension will be accumulated in your hands, okay? In the first place, when I uh, came across to your system, it looked me like this is very simple because <laughs> two notes, you know, uh, and so simply organized everything. But through this half a year when we studied together, you guide me through the system with the book, I understand how much really mental effort it requires to develop it. So this is a re really difficult, re really difficult program. In the result video of book three, um, I just only have one comment actually. Um, it's about, I, I saw it right from the beginning. It's about your posture and I think we need to kind of revise it a little bit. So when you sat in the beginning, I could see that you know, the idea of uh, good posture is you initially sit with a very relaxed posture and then by bringing the top of your head upwards and a little bit backwards and chin down, you are naturally making it more straight. But what I've seen in the video is that you kind of, in the low back area, you made this little movement like that. And it's almost like you were trying to artificially keep it straight. And this is what we want to avoid. Um, so just a correction that when you think about um, correct posture, it starts from a very easy, relaxed, initial posture this way. And then you think about your top of your head and this is loose and this is loose and your back is a trunk of your tree which is not moving. So not this. Yeah, so it, the second thing was also about your head. So just make sure that really your neck is completely aligned with your back. And for that, again, the top of your head remember upwards but also backwards and then chin down so remember those three points three sensations about your head all right so relax your back first aha uh -huh, good mm -hmm. 
Now by bringing your top of your head upwards and backwards, and really you should feel like someone is pulling you. Okay, this is upwards and backwards. Okay, and not chin down. Um. Chin down. Yeah, okay, this is good. You will see in the video. This is what a, a composed pianist look like. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. So this is a good posture, the low back. There is no artificial kind of pushing. Um, looks very relaxed yet straight. Your neck is could aligned. We, mm. Could we repeat, please, the process? Okay. To confirm. All right. So first, yes, relaxed back. Second, someone is gently pulling you upwards from the top of your head and backwards. And chin down. And the bottom line is you need to keep your back straight, not with the effort of the muscles of your back, but with um, a gentle pull of your head up. And again, this is like probably the only thing that is not my own find in this whole piano world system. This is from Alexander Technique, um, and I found it uh, very easy to do, and it, it's so it's so right because. I, I completely uh, ruined my low back, unfortunately. And now, for six, no, since I was 16 years old, I have chronic low back pain. Because a one good teacher told me, sit straight. And so I said, <laughs> and you know how teachers in Russia, they take your body ruthlessly, and they just like, and okay, that's how I need to sit, Ugh, you know, and it hurt, but I was like, well, it's supposed to hurt, you know, and then I sat like this for, you know, 20 years of my life, and uh, now I, it's chronic, it never goes away, this pain. Uh, you were trying to make so much as all the steps for the result of book three, and um, you might have felt fr maybe frustrated because there is so much needs to be done in a very short period of time. But as you will learn in this book, um, the whole process of learning a piece, of finishing or completing the piece, will consist of three stages analysis, learning, and then practice performance. And you, just for book three, I believe you've just done analysis, maybe a little bit of learning. Uh, but with a normal piece, when you leave 70% um, of time for learning and practice performance stage, then what you have accomplished in analysis stage will feel easier, will feel more comfortable, will feel more natural, um, and just more enjoyable, really, uh, with less struggle. I know you've tried your best, especially with a true voice, to play in a very detached and easy way, but it will become much more organic and natural when you actually going to complete all, all stages, so, so you know. Mm. Probably the first question is, when you look at the score and you're thinking, why the scale is arranged in by octaves and not by, uh, yeah. <laughs> by eight. So there is obviously a reason and the reason is because um, it will make much more sense when we're going to apply timing and phrasing. Because as you can see, I take one octave as a motif with the main interval leading to the keynote. Mm -hmm. So, um, it is somehow, it, it is helping the, the technique at the end of the day. What we actually want to learn with the scales is um, to explore how fast we can actually play, right? 
Mm. Second question that you might have is why I have chosen circle notes the way I've chosen them. Mm. And again, mm, tell me. I th this particular questions I understand why. Do you um, want to try to explain? Yes, uh, I think uh, the first note is not circled because uh, we consider that previous passage was going from up to bottom so the first note is to the left and the next note changes the direction mm -hmm. and that's why we circle it mm -hmm. So let, let's just explain. Yeah, so when we're, for example, coming from C major to D major. Oh, yes, this is a bit too loud. So we go on. To the left, and then by the rule in the passage is the first note that leads the passage in the opposite direction, which is to the right. That's why we choose it. And for the same reason, when we go down, right? The first note... So we were going up, 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 up. And now the first note, which gonna mm, redirect all the notes to the left. And we choose on that note for our album motion. Alright, what about others? Mm, well scale or arpeggio like passages, repetitive passage. So in this case, we don't look at the positions at the brackets anymore. We're just trying to choose those stepping stones, kind of relative downbeats, um, inside the passage and just circle them. And so because we're not organizing it by eight, not one, two, three, four, five, Which in this case would be easy, uh, let's say on every first note out of four we would circle, we would move, move our elbow here, right? But because they are organized, it's kind of like a bit jazzy to find <laughs> the those inner, you know, down beats, and so. The best way I've come up is, yeah, two, two, and three. What else it could be? I don't know. Could be three and four. So, do, re, mi, fa, so, re, si, do, re, mi, fa, so, re, si, do. Probably. And that's why, actually, it's very important that we are going to the third step of our discussion, turning uh, thumb under because that needs to be understood very clear to escape a natural twist of the wrist or tension or stretch here all right ascending 3d motion on circle nodes so it's for both hands right hand or left hand it's the same as long as we go up um, in anti-clockwise motion on the third note in the scale. So when you play it, at six o'clock you let go of the note. This is the first very important thing because most of the students tend to overseat on the circle note and still keep playing it when it's already too late and that creates tension here. So as soon as you press that circle note, literally at 6 o'clock, let go of the key right away. Why I'm not so um, keen on holding the notes and playing everything super connected in a slow tempo is because um, we're not playing this exercises to play in a slow tempo. <laughs> And when you're going to play in a fast tempo, you will not hear the difference, you know, between holding the notes and playing legato. Like I'm playing right now, 
letting go. First, third and fifth note of the scale. And so when I play fast, who will care if you connect notes or not? All you care is that it's even in rhythm and sound, you know? But eventually all those slow motions that you create in your hand uh, at 3D level, um, those sensations will just go to muscle memory and when you're going to play in a fast tempo, it will lead to easiness in your hand and avoiding um, tension, unhealthy tension, which you obviously create if you try to connect everything. And initiate elbow motion with a fast and light movement. So, not only you let go at six, but you make sure that together you move your elbow, which will bring your, your thumb to the next key at three o'clock. So, Six o'clock elbow, which brings naturally at about three o'clock thumb to F. So you can just try on this from E to F. And make sure, remember all of the movements that we do, uh, try to keep, try to still have a uh, connection uh, with your fingertips to the surface of the key. Don't go like jumping like that, right? Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh. all right, so that's clear. And finish the roll and land on the key at six o'clock. So finishing the roll 12, nine, and at six, we are landing on our thumb. All right, so it's, it's a very natural movement, but you have to understand it every single step. So at six o'clock, let go of the finger, move elbow, that prepares your thumb to F, it's already on F, finish the roll 12, nine, at six, you play again. Let's do the same on G. So now this is our fifth note, the next note for moving elbow. The same. Let go, move elbow. At three o'clock we prepared our finger in this case to A. Finish the roll and at six play. So. Very good. And also I think I need to mention that, yes, right now it's all gonna look very strange. But eventually, as you remember, the faster we go, the less three-dimensional movements become, and so they will become more and more flat. And so eventually, with this very constant and rhythmical elbow motion, we actually create an illusion that we are just moving our elbow back and forth, which in turn um, leads the rest of the arm. So instead of playing this, which is a common mistake, or not moving at all, and then feeling stiff, you get uh, very, very, very easy, just uh, almost like a painter <laughs> with the brush motion, okay? That's the reason why we have all those circles here, 
Okay, I hope that's clear. Good. Um, let's try... Oh yeah, so I mentioned during the entire motion, fingertips should not leave the surface of the keys. Got that. Good. Let's do the same as the left hand, also ascending, please. Again. Mm, yeah. Good. Yeah, so in this case here, um, Example, let's take a look at the thumbs. So again, the fifth note, as you can see, G is circled. So here at six o'clock, we let go of the thumb, move our elbow, which in turn will bring third finger at nine o'clock. We finish 12, at three o'clock, which in turn brings our finger at three o'clock. We turn 12, nine, and at six, we play. So. like rabbits above the keyboard <laughs> so the fingertips on the keys in in C major scale it's okay but in some scales like for example the F, F. major scale yes when you go down try to mm -hmm. play F major scale solely mm -hmm. from the right, right hand so here You will have to, um, I suppose, to stretch a little bit, but because you are going to let go right away on B flat, that little stretch will be released. And uh, which is also a good example because not everything, especially if you're going to play Rachmaninoff or Liszt, not everything will be 100% correct and comfortable. There will be, especially in passages, moments where you have to stretch, but it's about what do you do after the stretch. So this is a very good example, so yes, you have to cross a little bit, but at B flat, you release right away. Yeah, okay, you see, um, the same, remember the same principle, like what I say, I will repeat. So when you play C, you need to bring four finger on B flat at nine o'clock. You were bringing it a bit too late. You were kind of sitting for too long and you will start bringing B flat when you were already at 12 or one. It's too late. So with that, at six you play, with nine you bring the finger. The only difference is that you don't let go the note and you don't move your elbow at six. So the, the roll helps to bring the next finger. You bring it with the effort of the hand. I will repeat again. Focus that you're not bringing your finger. You simply, you bring in your hand with the motion of your hand to nine o'clock, you bring in your finger. Because if you're gonna start bringing your finger, that will create tension. Remember, we never play with isolation of fingers. It's just with the roll. The roll gently brings your finger to be flat at nine. I do this uh, motion to the nine o'clock but my... I learn how to make the roll with also shifting your hand. Just that motion. Look closely. So I'm moving from six to nine. If you want to connect. So when you go from six to nine, this is where your hand also moving while your thumb stays in place. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and it will with time it will become more natural. Right now it's like a little bit <laughs> in a rush, but I we need to understand the path here very clear. Mm. Yes, yeah, so the same would be I believe B major left hand up. So the same problem you will have. So you would go on G sharp, then you play E and so on E at 6 with the movement of your roll towards 3 you bring your 4th finger to F sharp and then at 12, nine, uh, 12, 9 and 6 you play so 6, 3, 12, 9 and play Also, I want to mention here actually also important that when I'm saying to bring your next finger with the motion of your hand to F, it's not necessarily that you really need to prepare it and keep it on F sharp through the whole roll. It's more like an intention of the hand being around that next note. You're kind of bringing, you, you just Shift. I would. I would even. I would not even say bring your finger at th at three o'clock. I would say bring your hand at three o'clock to a new position. Yeah, that feel more relaxed. Yeah, exactly. It's like uh, on the motion of inertia, like your. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what I mean, upper. with the effort of your hand, not, not the finger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is an important skill to learn. Because like I said, not every time we're going to escape all the stretches. Sometimes we need to hold on to the note and connect it legato. Um, yeah, a little bit about the left hand is is the problem because of going with elbow motion towards, towards. the torso. Yeah. Yeah. So it will feel and a bit. Mm. So yeah, this um, a, also a limited very, space. Yeah, it was very good that you mentioned that because of course, well, let's read that the next one: move torso from the middle position to the right and back with every two octaves so what that means is that we're gonna play four octaves that means that you don't just sit in the middle that means that initially you sit a little bit on the left when you're gonna play the first two octaves and then as soon as you finish you reach kind of middle C middle part you shift to the right so this will somehow give at least at least when you go to the right with your left hand if you're not sitting at the middle but actually you're shifting your torso then you create a little bit more space and uh, this is it this is basically three important moments to recognize in the scale and obviously as you can see i've written I've written here in the book all the routine that you will need to play and these are just major scales and if you are nerdy enough you can of course go with playing minors white keys major black keys and minor black keys and the whole uh, set of the rules and patterns and rhythms will stay the same. Nothing will change. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's go to now our pages and let's look through the motion of our pages. Now that you learn about scales, our pages might feel a bit easier. So again, I have grouped uh, the nose here by three, so there are groups of three instead of again maybe four, as we used to play. 
because again that will be beneficial for our phrasing um, and timing. Yeah, well, tell me why did we? Why did I decide to circle um, every keynote in arpeggios? Because it's downbeat. And in, okay, in the exactly. in the first uh, bar, you circle the second note because considering that previous passage was going down, and it's the first note that leads the passage yeah. to the right. Just like here, when they come back, that would be the first note that leads our hand to the left. Alright, so now let's talk about the th thumb over, right? So, it coincides with the um, um, circle note. So let's see if we can keep the same approach. By the way, another another uh -huh. another thing we have a stretch we have to hold the G right so we already know we're gonna play at three and now this time instead of shifting from the top like in scale we're actually shifting in hand from the bottom mm -hmm. so let's see so we're playing at six and then kind of towards the three we're shifting our hand downwards and bringing our thumb to C and then at 12, 9, at 6 we play and again it might feel a bit stretchy over here but if you do it correctly as soon as you play C it's our circle note aha so now we're gonna let go at 6 and release our tension that we might have accumulated before. So so now we learn how with the movement, we actually, with the movement of the hand, we bring our thumb around the area of the next note. Let's try that. I like that. Mm. Should we look at them? Well, this is easier mm. because it's on the thumb. So I suppose it's the left hand. The left hand is going to be harder when you go down. So let's do the same. So when we play E, six o'clock to nine we bring our thumb to the area of the next note 12 3 and play at six and let go You still have it a little bit. Make sure that you're not bringing uh, your thumb in an isolated way to C. That it's really uh -huh. your kind of thumb goes together with the hand. Yeah, exactly. Now this is in a natural way. Exactly. This is with the um, impulse of your hand instead of this because this is what caused tension this is uh, horrible here exactly this is no this is fine your thumb is not doing anything here he just lands <laughs> yeah Thank 
you. All good, all good, all good. So the first thing, sit higher. You understood why? I suggest an octave and chords to sit higher. Okay, this is my stretch to reach this octave. Now if I go a bit higher, I right away feel that my hand becomes bigger. I need less stretch. So the lower you sit, the more you need to stretch your hand to reach the same distance. Uh, that's why you will bring much more ease to uh, here, um, especially if your hand is narrow. Hello, my alien hand <laughs> with long fingers and narrow palm. So that really helps. Uh, you can actually see many times how people really sit much higher when they play Rachmaninoff. It does help. We is, except when we're going to go to uh, octaves in a minute, it also helps with the lips because the same principle, let's say one lip is, is your octave, right? <laughs> and you're trying to you know, stretch your hand across the lip. So the higher you sit, the less distance you need to cross to reach the same um, interval, the same chord, to make the same jump. Okay, so again, as you can see, everything is organized. Uh, we group octaves again by key notes, just like in scales. We choose the same circle notes, just like in scales, all for the same reason that we just mentioned. All right, for the phrasing and the timing and the, those relative downbeats and just to organize in rhythm our motion of our elbow. Um, let's talk about how, what to do when you play the octave. So what is the most important thing is that we're closing our hand. We're not keeping the stretch. So instead of playing this, we actually, we are closing our hand. And the question is of how much you close. I would say do a position, you know, I don't know, till, you know, like if you play C, till your thumb reaches, let's say F, you know. Basically, a couple of notes, skipping. So you don't necessarily need to bring your thumb to A, you know, mm -hmm. not like that, but more like that. Mm. As long as there is no more stretch anymore. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that brings us to the next step of, well, so what? We're not holding both of the notes in the octave. And the answer is, yeah, duh. <laughs> just like in chords. So remember, this is actually a rule again from the book one. When we play, we were playing, remember, even thirds. Yeah, we never really hold on to, to both notes. It's the same principle here. The octave is the same interval. So it's just a matter of deciding to which you know, note we're holding on. And of course, it makes more sense if we're making a, a roll in a slow tempo to the right, and we hold on to the top in both hands. Mm. And when we go down, we hold on to the bottom. Mm, yeah, why we even need those circle notes when we play octaves? Because the, ah. ev every mm. octave can be the position. That's what I wanted. Mm, very good question. Well done. Um, good reminder. So every octave is technically a position and we would need to move elbow on every note. But the thing is that would create... <sighs> it would feel very busy. And it, it would be very hard to control in a fast tempo. And actually that would create, instead of a one line that uh, with our elbow, well, that's what we want, 
that would create more like a little pixels <laughs> we actually we do want to somehow arrange uh, our position change notes so some notes will be played with inertia <laughs> which is done with the initial elbow motion so again we're choosing this kind of uh, down beats and of course it's not optimal and kind of against the rule but somehow it works better moving here 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 so then that's the idea So let's try. So I think the same principle on the circle notes at six. So when you see circle note on the octave, remember we let go of both fingers at six, moving elbow, which kind of brings our hand to the next octave. And then 12, nine, at six we play again. And hold on to the top. Next. Question, a little dumb question, but still, uh, when we play holding on, when we still need to release the key on when the point of the clock? Aha, uh -huh. good question. So, let's see. After th maybe 12, maybe it's about 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely by 9, it's up. Yeah, I would say about 9. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for example, there are lots of black keys. Mm, what fingers do you use for those black keys? Fourth, five, or even third finger to on up, like to play legato, for example. So for, for example, A sharp, I may use fourth finger. Then, what finger do you use? Third, or five, or fourth? That question. Mm. If it's a very important part in our playing that we try to prevent our hand from, from the stretch. Then it only makes sense that on the black keys we play with the fifth finger. Which is, could be the case if we have a little... I don't know. One passage up and down. But since we are playing this whole routine, which is C major, D major, E, F, G, A, B, non-stop, in a very fast tempo, up and down, up and down, we need to think about um, uh, not accumulating too much tension and give our f uh, fingers some rest. So I suggest forget about stretch here, of course, it's inevitable but use finger four on the black key to give rest to this little pinky here. Because this will take time to play in a fast tempo through all seven keys and you need rest, so four finger on the black keys. Um, yes. So for my hand I play um, white key then black key with my fourth finger and then I feel like my third finger is already there and I can play this 
and it is on a circle note so I can release and then uh, play with so interchanging between fourth and third and five fingers no because when you're gonna move from the third finger to what four or five oh uh, it's quite a big it's quite a big distance uh, yeah yeah in fast tempo <laughs> I guess the question is it's all for the yeah I guess tempo. the question was uh, arisen because of not playing in fast tempo because we, when we play, play in fast tempo the four finger is only the choice because that's that mass of fingers you need to save time yeah, yeah because jumping from three to five or four to four yeah yeah from four yeah thank, three to thank four. you yeah but again coming back to just uh, your repertoire then of course um i play uh, unless it's a long exhausting challenging passage where changing the fingers is beneficial to have a break for, for muscles. I play everything with five. Mm. I play five on the black keys everywhere. You know that, that sometimes teacher, teachers uh, suggest you to play extremely legato octaves like yeah, like yeah, they also suggest mm. to play extremely legato scales and everything. And then 50% of pianists end up with injured hands, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like maybe... But they do suggest to do that because they want to create legato and they want to create the melody. You need to see what is behind their request. Like if you play on um, Octave yeah. Etude by Chopin, for example. Yeah. Or the middle part, you yeah, mean, the right? Middle part. Because again, you don't need it in the in the other parts. Again, all of this legato creates pedal, tone, timing. Pedal, tone, dynamics, timing. These are three things that create the illusion of legato, which will appear if behind it you have the knowledge of sound imagination, intonation, arm weight, and phrasing. This will create the illusion of legata. Connecting the notes, <laughs> the funny thing. Okay, so even if you try to connect and play legato, how many times is still not legato? <laughs> so it's important to mention also where we need to keep our fingers when we play octaves. And again, because our goal is to feel how we can play octaves in a very fast tempo, uh, we need to think about um, economic <laughs> distances <laughs> and motions. So for that reason, right, when we play, let's say, um, a key that has a combination of white and black keys, right, a scale with white and black keys, make sure that your thumb, it's really about mostly even the thumb, is very near the black keys and when you play in the black keys it's very near the black key the white keys so try to play with your thumb on this line so instead of doing this you just you kind of go almost playing on one line that way of course you will You will turn. I mean, your pinky also should play on the same line. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. So maybe you're right. You actually you do turn your hand after all, because if you just if you just do like this, then of course your pinky will be stuck. <laughs> so okay. So it's your thumb there, and then you turn your hand a little bit. I suppose that way. So both of the fingers on the same line. Okay. Good, good. And also, since we talk about positioning hand, where do we position our sight when we play any of the exercises and why? I don't understand why, but maybe because it, is, it, it releases excessive tension of our mind. We always know where to look. Uh, but, yeah, uh, you suggest to look at the same point closer to the, I don't know, this red line 
upper of the mm -hmm. black keys and the question mm -hmm. is arises related to that when we play together with both hands I usually tend to look towards the left hand I don't know why since my childhood I mm -hmm. always looking towards my left hand but yeah you don't even you don't even think if you sometimes eye side jump between because sometimes you look more towards the left hand but maybe sometimes you look more towards your right hand I think what is important is just you gently without fixation just kind of place your side over here now why it is important is that again when we're gonna play in a fast tempo if you were practicing uh, when we play in a fast tempo every single motion counts and when you practice um, let's say this exercise you're going through so many layers and imagine that you were practicing you know nine out of ten layers looking differently and then and then on the ten layer and this and, and then you want to start playing fast and then you actually decided instead of here to look there that will affect that will affect your speed and focus because somehow the, the the placement of our sight affects our brain and so that will in turn affect the control of our speed and muscle because as you remember all the virtuosity is in our head it's mental mm. Yeah, but it's also a little bit like uh, with fingering. Remember, the whole point of fingering is just to fix them right away in the score, not to confuse your mind by playing different fingers every time you know you play the next day. It's the same with the sight. Um, you want to kind of fix your sight at, at like the same point, or at least knowing exactly what you're doing. So it won't change and in turn uh, will interfere with your focus when you're going to start playing fast. Again, for slow tempo, it doesn't matter. I never even think about where I look when I play in a slow tempo. But if, let's say, you need to play a fast virtuoso piece, uh, make sure that you always practice uh, knowing where, where you look exactly. Because that little thing, for the speed, every single thing will count. And that little thing, that little thing will count as well. For me, it's maybe like looking along the line, the horizontal line, uh, up uh, on the. Yes, okay. I, li I like the That's expression of glancing, glancing and mm -hmm. gliding across. So it's better to put, yeah, um, gliding gently without fixation your side along the red line. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's put it that way, okay. So again, with chords, uh, as I explained just before, it's good to sit higher because it will create less distance in lips, and so it's good for accuracy. And um, again, with the fingering, as you can see, ah, here, here it is, you know, you use always in both hands, third finger on the black keys and fourth finger on the white keys. Again, no confusion there. So we're going to play the chords this way. So every single chord is, of course, a position change. So here you have to move your elbow. Again, because it's a big chord, we don't want to um, sustain the stretch, so we need to close the hand. So since every chord is going to be circled, we don't have to hold on to any notes. You have to let go all the fingers and close your hand. And um, you also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you also write, do not moving, do not move your torso. Yeah, it's for the same principle as with why we didn't circle every note in scales, because that would create more actually tension by moving torso all the time, even though we actually changing um, octaves. Um, 
so um, again remember that when we make in a slow tempo when we connect two position change chords with the swing we're gonna make a double swing all right so one double and second here's one here's again two not this